Hello. In the last lecture, we have seen Wittgenstein's picture theory of meaning. Today, we will be looking into the relationship between language and world. In picture theory of meaning, we have seen that language can represent the world. And also, we have seen that the elements of the language are related in certain way with the elements in the world world or the objects in the world. Now we will be revisiting these aspects and going to some more aspects in today's lecture. And Tractatus can be treated as a treatise on propositions. The whole of the Tractatus contains specific propositions. As I described earlier, numbered from 1 to 7 with subparts and all are clearly unambiguously stated propositions so it's a, and the what the, uh, the what the tractatus contains is also proposition and it is about proposition and how a proposition represents reality so a treatise on proposition is written in propositional form further at the last part of the book that will be coming later on, he will just analyze or critically examine the possibility of studying propositions with propositions. So ultimately we can say that the Tractatus is a treatise on propositions. The correlation between language and the world are prominent in this treatise as we have seen the whole treatise is aimed to explain the representation of world in language. So that's why we told that picture theory is the most celebrated contribution in practice. So the picture theory actually explains the relation between language and world. And this correlation can be treated at three levels, the relation between language and world can be treated at three levels which we will be taking up in this class itself. The relation between language and world, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that the limit of language. You can represent reality using language. That's the first aspect which we are going to study. Secondly, there is a limit for language. Now what it is going to do with the world, that's the second question. And thirdly, the aspects that are beyond language. In practice itself deals with all these three aspects and which we will be looking into one by one. Firstly, the relation between language and world. Tractatus presupposes that language and world shares the same structure. They are isomorphic. We have seen that language, thought and reality or world. They share the same structure. Again, when we speak about structure, just think about what we have studied in the last class, the relation between structure and form. So, when we talk about structure, that's how elements of a picture are related. And the form is the possibility of that relation. So, the way in which elements are, the words are related in language, in the same way objects are related in the world. So there, are, there is a structural similarity or there is an isomorphism of structure or isomorphism of language and world. They share the same logical form too. That's another important. It's not only structure. If the structure is the same, the possibility of that structure also must be the same. Now the possibility of that structure is logical form. What makes the elements to relate? What makes it possible for the elements in the picture to relate in certain way? That possibility is pictorial form. Now, if the picture as well as the world has got the same form, same structure, then they must share the same logical form also. This is an important point when we come to the limits of language. So, this is an important point that they both have the same form too. Now, as far as practice is concerned, propositions are either possible or impossible. We are seeing in the letter this thing. Correspondingly, state of affairs are either possible or impossible. A musical note, the possibility of proposition is a musical note 
can be weaker or louder. It can have low noise or high noise, high level of sound, a musical note, but cannot be red or green. There is no colored note. So in the same way, there are limitations or possibilities and impossibility for proposition also. In the same way, state of affairs, in state of affairs also there are limitations. So the way in which the propositions are limited or by its possibility and impossibility, in the same way the world is also limited in the possibility and impossibility. The propositions have sense and the pictures of reality we already studied. The proposition makes it sense or it produces itself sense from itself and it's that sense which make it possible to be a picture of reality if it represent that reality okay in sin and bidetum we have seen that the sense of a proposition is the meaning that it generates from within and it has got a reference in the world so propositions have sense and are the pictures of reality by being that sense corresponds to that reality and they are either true or false. If that sense corresponds to the reality or if corresponding to this sense, if there exists a reality, the proposition is true. When I say that rose is red, rose is red is a proposition which has got a sense of its own. Now, the proposition is true if actually rose is red in the world, if it corresponds to that reality or else it's false. So this this sense of the proposition makes it possible to be either true or false. All propositions. Now, there are possible proposition as well as impossible proposition. We cannot speak of impossible proposition because it doesn't make any sense. All like, I slept well tomorrow. Okay. I'll be, okay. I slept well tomorrow. That's an impossible thing. Yeah. I'll be sleeping well tomorrow. That I can just predict but I slept well tomorrow is an impossible thing so it doesn't make any sense they are neither true nor false they are simply nonsensical now in order to be something to be true or false it must have some sense so propositions which are possible are sensible also propositions which are impossible are senseless nonsensical and propositions which are possible are sensible they are having sense. And by virtue of this sense, the possible propositions are either true or false. And all these true and false propositions put together forms language. In language, it's full of possibilities. And so, uh, among all possible propositions, whatever is true and false, or the all possible propositions are either true or false. They together forms the language. All the possible propositions put together forms the language. And only true propositions actually represents the world. I can uh, think of a golden mountain. But that golden mountain may not exist. But there is nothing nonsensical to think about that. But if there is a real golden mountain, then it's a part of world. Otherwise, that proposition is not a part of world. So, propositions which are true makes the represents the real world. And or we can say that the world is the totality of positive facts existing or existing states of affairs. We can say that all the true propositions together makes what we call fact. And these facts can be either positive or negative, existing or non-existing. We have studied it earlier. So, all the existing facts or all the positive facts together makes the world. All the positive as well as negative facts or the existing as well as non-existing facts together makes the reality. Out of which the reality is, is say there is no elephant in the room. is a fact. But it is not positive one because it speaks about the absence. So, no elephant in the room is not the part of world. An empty room is the part of world. So, among the totality of language, whatever is true propositions may, becomes the facts. And among the facts, whatever is positive becomes the world. That is the relation between language and world. The correspondence between language and world may be 
trace this the relationship one to one correspondence can be traced in this way uh, the left side is that of language and the right side that's world names in language represents objects in the world corresponding to each and every name in language there are objects in the world and elementary propositions in language that's two names combined together the elementary propositions or simple propositions in language represent state of affairs okay the true proposition all true propositions represent facts and the last is it cannot be it can be write, written in that way only among facts there are positive as well as negative facts and all positive facts together in language represent the world or whole language whole facts represent reality actually but among the positive facts or true propositions which are positive in nature that in as a part of language represents the world so language and world there is one to one correspondence now we will come to the so we have seen the relation between language and world now we will come to the limits of language okay the world is represented by true propositions the fact the collection of true proposition is the collection of facts elementary proposition rep represents state of affairs we have studied that elementary proposition that simple propositions represent state of affairs elementary propositions are independent of each other these elementary propositions can be that's a form of logical atomism they can stand independent of each other and so are state of affairs state of affairs also can be independent of each other now the four underlying propositions and world determines their limits we are seeing that the language and the world has got the same structure there is an isomorphism now if they have the same structure the possibility of that structure the form is is also same and if they have the same form then the structure of the, sorry the form of proposition limits the form of representation of world so they are limited anything that exists in the world can be thought and talked about since the language and world has got the same form the possibility of expression in language and the possibility of existence in the world that's how language leads to ontology the possibility with which you can represent thought or you can represent things in language or you can think the possibility of thinking is the possibility of existence because the world the form of the world and the form of the thought and the form of the language are one and the same so anything in exists in the world can be thought about and talked about whatever in the world we can talk about we can think about that because whatever existing in the world has got a form which is similar to the form of our thought and language so the reality whatever is real we can say can be thought about and talked about what cannot be thought cannot be put into propositions and cannot exist in the world what we cannot think about if we cannot think about that then that means that the logical form does not permit that thought then such thing cannot exist in the world and that cannot we cannot if you cannot think about that we cannot express it in language so wittgenstein sees the limits of the language is the limits of the world wittgenstein famously say that the limits of my language means the limits of my world my language limits my understanding of reality or my understanding of reality is determined and limited by my language and this so the relationship between language and reality as far as the limit of language is concerned now coming to what's beyond language if is there any reality beyond language that we just examine in this section according to practitus the meaning of picture lies outside the picture in the last lecture we have seen that a picture represents its reality from outside so meaning of a picture cannot be in the picture itself a picture cannot represent itself so the picture is re representing something which is beyond that outside that so the meaning of a picture must be outside the picture the reality which the picture represent is outside the picture and thus the meaning of the world in space and time lies outside space and time the world 
is what is represented in what can be represented in language and if that's what is represented in language the world in space and time then its meaning must lie outside and that's why Wittgenstein says that ethics is transcendental it's beyond experience we cannot seek the meaning of life why we live we cannot ask this question by being in this world because the meaning the world is a representation and the representation from outside always what is represented is outside of representation so we cannot by being in the world ask the meaning of life thus the meaning of world in space and time lies outside space and time then the form of language cannot be expressed in language we already seen that a picture cannot express its pictorial form it displays it so a form of language cannot be expressed in that's a possibility cannot be expressed in language what the language express cannot be expressed in language what actually the language does cannot be expressed in language and here we just speaks about the inexpressible and unthinkable realities because what is expressed there is something the possibility of expression that's lying behind that what is expressed so that becomes inexpressible for Wittgenstein as far as Wittgenstein is concerned they cannot be put into words because they, they are what language they are what is expressed through language displayed through language so they cannot be expressed in language as the self cannot be brought out in the world the self is what sees the world so they cannot be thought or explained they manifest themselves they are called the mystical they manifest themselves, they manifest through language, not in language. And they are called mystical. And of such inexpressible thing, nothing can be said. We cannot see, say anything about that. And they are beyond language. They are the facts or they are the things that are beyond language. Because we cannot put them into language. And hence, it is famously declares as the seventh proposition in Tractatus, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. That's beyond language. Whatever is beyond language, we cannot speak about. And again, about Tractatus itself, it just makes a criticism that the Tractatus goes beyond language. You have to note it down. I, I not made the slide in about this. <coughs> what this says is that the aim of the Tractatus is beyond what the Tractatus does. Because he says in 6.54, the 7th is the last proposition that which declares that whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. The proposition just before that, 6.54, he says, my proposition serve as elucidations in the following way. It can be used in the following way. Anyone who understands me eventually recognizes them as nonsensical. Because what he is trying to do is to find out the possibilities of proposition using the position. So he is trying to picture a proposition using the position. Or he is trying to make a picture of itself. So anyone who understands me eventually recognizes them as nonsensical. When he has used them hyphen, he has used this whole text practice, hyphen, as steps, hyphen, it's just like you are using ladder, to climb up beyond them. You have to understand this and give, go beyond them. In bracket he writes, he must, so to speak, throw away the ladder, throw away the ladder after he has climbed up it. Once you reach the top, you have to throw away the ladder. So his propositions, the whole of Tractatus is to find the limit of language and using language. And once you use it fully, once you understand it, you have to throw away the whole text. He must transcend these propositions. He must go beyond these propositions. He must transcend these propositions. And then he will see the world aright. 
only when you can go beyond only when you can think beyond whatever is stated in tractatus you can see the tractorial representations in the right way that's all about tractatus thank you by in the next lectures we look into the later philosophy of Wittgenstein.